Good talk. So again, uh, Rob Sherwood, uh, Big Switch Networks. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I have to say, from the very beginning, uh, a lot of the, what, what I'm going to present here actually is based on, uh, on work that, that Dave did, and it's definitely a, a big thanks to him for that. So I'd like forks from uh, Beacon about a year ago. Uh, some people have uh, very quickly likened it to Beacon uh, without uh, OSGI. Uh, it's definitely more than that, uh, but let me uh, get into some of the details with you. So, kind of the, the, the big picture is, uh, in terms of what, what we think is important for a controller, uh, particularly because we're a software company, or uh, different from the rest of these companies, uh, different from the rest of these controllers, this is the only Apache licensed controller. And, and so this lets us, it lets our partners, it lets everyone actually you know, build on this controller without really fear that you know, the IPR is gonna get in the way. Um, we are building on top of Java, and some people don't like Java and, you know, uh, for, for what you will. Uh, everybody has their own language choices. Uh, we recently added support for Jython, which is a, a Java-based Python interpreter. Um, uh, in, in terms of tool chain, uh, I, I'm going to show for the purpose of demos tools that I've kind of whipped, quickly whipped up uh, and how easy that is to do. Uh, and and you know, maybe the, the most important thing about this is this is actually the, the core of our commercial controller. And so, yes, while there's a, a growing open source movement behind it, and you know, yes, we're getting lots of outside contributors and all sorts of interest, and uh, there's a little bit of a struggle uh, internally to keep up with the, the open source wave, uh, the important thing to know is that you know, our, our full company is behind this controller trying to make it better both for the open source and for the closed source. Uh, and, and so it's not, uh, it's not that it's going to go away anytime soon. Uh, and so with that in mind, let me get into to some of the, the details of where you might start. Uh, I, I definitely agree with uh, everyone who's talked before. You know, uh, usability is, is a chief concern uh, for this. And so uh, grabbing uh, and, and running Floodlight, uh, you could have it up and running in the time it would take to download plus you know, five or six seconds. Um, you can uh, either grab the, the code directly from our, our website using Git. Uh, you can download the VM, which actually looks a lot like the uh, tutorial VM. It includes you know, a pre-built version of Wireshark, MiniNet, and the Wireshark Detector, uh, Floodlight and the Wireshark Detector. And that'll get you started. Uh, you run Ant, which is Java's version of Make. There's even uh, a Make file there for people like me who can't remember to type Ant. If you type Make, it still does the right thing. Uh, and then to, to execute it, you actually run like you would any other Java program. Uh, and so that gets you an up and running controller. Uh, the, the, the high point here is that uh, there's really no external dependencies. Uh, it's pure Java based. Uh, to, uh, to Murphy's point, it was definitely a lesson that I learned from writing controllers or working on controllers for a long time that you know, e ease of use e means not just at an API level, it also means at a deployment level. Um, kind of a, a high-level architecture view of how we see this working is you imagine there's some set of switches. Uh, maybe the switches aren't even pure open flow switches. Uh, I'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, Floodlight has control for, for dealing with non-open flow-based topologies. Uh, they're talking to the core of the Floodlight controller and then their applications on top. And some of these applications are Java-based, some of them are jython based some are even uh, REST-based. And, and I'll talk about our REST APIs as well. And the idea is you as a programmer have a choice of you know, what language do I want to work in? Uh, do I work on more of the core? Or do I want to build an application that's built on top of the core? And, and all of these things are possible and all these things are, are encouraged. So uh, kind of the, the block level diagram uh, of how this controller works. Uh, many of these things are actually in common with the other controllers. These are the things that kind of naturally make sense once you build an OpenFlow controller. Uh, we have all sorts of modules. Modules export services, and modules can depend on other services. And so the idea, the decoupling between a module and a service, uh, is is really the difference between an implementation and an interface. So a service is an interface, and a module is an implementation. And so you can actually swap out the implementation of one module as long as it still supports the same service. Um, the main module is the floodlight provider, very much into the uh, the beacon provider. Uh, provides all the open flow connectivity and whatnot, and everything is built based on top of that. Uh, our, we've totally gutted the uh, I.O. processing. Of, are any of you actually familiar with Netty? Uh, Netty is an open source, uh, high performance I.O. platform, uh, totally dependent from us. 
uh, FedSafe, all sorts of fun. And, and you know, we, we also built on top of uh, RESTlet, another uh, Java open source platform for, for our REST API. Um, <coughs> We can talk about more of this in the tutorial section, but at a high level, you know, there's a topology manager that computes paths. Uh, there's a link discovery module that does the path discovery. Uh, there's forwarding that figures out end-to-end -end forwarding. And, and critically, you know, something that I think is unique, if other people can correct me about our controller, is that uh, we actually handle all of the magic for figuring out you know, open, disconnected OpenFlow sets of islands that happen to share non-OpenFlow L2 switches. So, there, there's actually a lot of black magic in you know, deciding, it, it, should I broadcast this packet or not? Is this going to violate a spanning tree that I'm not a part of, but I'm affected by? Or where does this device actually exist uh, you know, if I'm sharing a broadcast domain across a non-OpenFlow L2 domain? Uh, we have uh, storage, we have um, REST, and I'll do a demo based on the, the REST. And, and kind of one of our, our easiest to least useful but easiest to understand applications is the, the static flow pusher, which is, it's almost an open flow level API. You can access it with REST. You say, for this specific switch, all traffic matching this pattern, send it out this port. And it, it, it's not reactive. It, it's actually pretty dumb. But it, it's actually really impressive to me. The number of applications people have built on top of it that actually do real world things. So. Uh, a little bit about our uh, modular architecture. Um, uh, a service in this context is actually just a Java interface. Uh, and so uh, each module, uh, each module is, has a set of services, and uh, each module exports state and events. And so from the state, users can get and set state. So you can say, I have you know, this list of switches. So that's information you can get. Uh, some of our modules actually allow you to override it. So, for example, you can, uh, when you get the list of topologies, you can actually assert a link that wasn't learned. Uh, that's useful in some data center environments. Um, you have uh, the the service model allows multiple implementations of the same service, um, and you know, for for each module, uh, it actually builds up a dependency graph of this module that depends on these services and these things to fill it, and you actually provide a configuration file for I want these these modules to be loaded. Uh, and the module loader resolves all of these dependencies and reports conflicts and reports ambiguity. You, know, you wanted service X, but it's, it's supported by module A and B. Which one did you want, A or B? You have to pick that type of thing. Uh, to implement a new module, which is how people would typically extend our controller. Uh, so this is in place of OSGI. Uh, I, I'm not sure if folks think this is complicated or not, but I, I can at least from, from personal experience, it is much, much simpler uh, to actually implement a new module. Um, you know, there are basically four, four methods that you implement. And if you're using something like Eclipse, it'll fill in a whole bunch of defaults for you. Uh, you say, I as a module, these are my dependencies. These are the things I provide. This is what I have to do to, to do my first round of initialization. This is what I have to do my second round. And the difference between the first and the second round uh, is basically to resolve things like uh, loops in the dependency graph. Uh, I mentioned Netty before. Uh, Netty is highly optimized uh, Java I.O. It's lots of uh, embedded functions, very common. Um, the benchmarking tool that Dave mentioned, Cbench, is something that actually I wrote uh, just to validate that you know, Java wasn't horrendously slow. Um, one of the things that we found, uh, both with that tool and with a couple papers that have written along these terms points, is that you really ultimately don't want to rewrite your own I.O. loops. It, it, it's, it's something that you, know, it's hard to get right. There's a lot of details in it. And you're much better off using an off-the-shelf library. And, and so this is the off-the-shelf library that we've used. Um, if you get the latest version of the Cbench results, uh, it turns out that Floodlight's actually slightly slower than some of the other controllers. That's simply because we haven't optimized our learning switch algorithm. The, the core is actually very fast. Uh, our, our threading model is. Uh, it's straightforward. Uh, all communication between modules needs to be through the service API. Um, uh, all inter-service calls need to be thread safe. Uh, event handling happens in the publisher's thread context. 
Uh, it's a little bit unintuitive, but it's actually a huge performance win for this. So if I post an event into the system, there's a, there's a new host, and everybody who wants to understand that there's a new host, that actually happens in my publisher's con in my thread context. And, and the idea is, uh, if somebody's going to do something more complicated, uh, they actually have to process that in a bottom half handler. Uh, and you know, to, to aid this, we have a, a thread pool executor service. So for modules that just want a quick task, uh, there's a pool of threads waiting for them as a common resource in the system for them to manage. Um, and you know, what, what's kind of nice about this model is that all of the standard locking mechanisms that you would get through, uh, through Java for synchronizing and message locking still apply. <coughs> I, uh, I, I, I couldn't help but notice uh, Dave's last slide about um, you know, the overhead that comes from having dynamically loadable modules. Um, we sacrifice dynamically loadable modules, so we actually can't do that at runtime. Uh, but we also lose about 25 calls on a stack frame if there's an error. So that you know, it, there's a trade-off here, but at least for our purposes, this is in fact the right one. <clears throat> so uh, the floodlight provider, this is the, the very core module, uh, manages all the I/O to OpenFlow switches. This is really the OpenFlow device driver. It says, you know, I have a new switch. Um, here's uh, new OpenFlow messages from it. It lets you write OpenFlow messages back down to the switch. This is actually a very small part of the total, uh, the total controller. I like to think of this, that, uh, I, I'm going to be trying to, to write this up as a blog post, but I, I think of OpenFlow almost like SCSI in, in terms of its uh, implementation, right? So if you think of an operating system, you know, the SCSI drive is a very small part of it. It's, it's for wrapping around a specific hardware device. It, it hides some of the implementation details. It's a very small part of the, the, of the whole. That's really what I think of as OpenFlow in terms of SDN. The, the OpenFlow device driver is a very small part of the whole. Uh, and, and SDN and the controller is, is a much, part, much larger part of the ecosystem. Uh, and so th this is the API just for the OpenFlow driver. Uh, we also have something that will, uh, a module will give you all the topology information. Uh, notably, uh, different from other, th this looks similar to other things, but the thing that's different is actually a switch cluster. That is, if you have uh, multiple switch, multiple OpenFlow islands that are disconnected, um, and that you know, they, they don't have a path, an OpenFlow path between them, you can actually still discover um, hosts between them if there's a broadcast domain or, or routers between them. So there's actually uh, a lot of work in terms of getting the, uh, the non-OpenFlow bits of the network to work with the OpenFlow bits. Uh, device manager lists, these are the end hosts in the network, these are the MAC addresses I've discovered. Uh, this, is the, this is where they attach to the network, this is their network location. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll be talking about the, the REST API in some detail in, in terms of the tutorial. Um, and so one thing that I just want to throw in is a quick plug. Uh, we also have a, a website, OpenFlow Hub, which is where Floodlight's being based. Uh, it has a lot of open, OpenFlow-based open source projects. Uh, Floodlight's just one of them. Uh, there's a number of others that are hosted off of there, uh, including uh, RouteFlow, which we've mentioned a couple times. Uh, if you are looking for a home for OpenFlow-based open source projects, uh, please drop us a line. There's lots of tools. Um, there's actually uh, completely independent of you know the the parent company that's actually paying for this, so uh, if you are interested in learning more, uh, you can check out the website, download the VM, download the code. Uh, there's a whole bunch of mailing lists. They're actually very active. We're getting a bunch of people who have nothing to do with uh, OpenFlow or Big Switch contributing, and that's good. Um, and with that in mind, let me jump to the demo. <coughs> So, um, so what I have in front of you is a mini net session. Let me start it again so you can see. Uh, I, I'm starting with the tree of nodes. Uh, there are four nodes total. Uh, it's connecting to the controller that I have running in this window. So I'm going to kill the controller for the second just to show you that if I try to do a ping with the controller down, things don't work. Uh, so what you're actually watching here, actually, I think should, people should be able to see that. 
What should we be looking at is host one trying to ping each of the other three hosts in the network and failing. We bring the controller up. Um, I, the, the, I have it on heavy debugging information so I can see, but so the, uh, the switches are up and I'll repeat the ping and all the pings work. Uh, that's all well and good. All the controllers here do this. That's great. Um, what I'm going to jump to now is something about the REST API. So uh, I'm going to show you a script that I wrote uh, for actually graphing the topology that we pull out of the, of the controller. And the thing about this script is it's not pretty, it's not nice, uh, it's functional, it works pretty well. The reason why I'm showing it to you is I wrote it in 20 minutes during a interop session for the ONF because we needed that tool. It, it wasn't that this is ever going to turn into a product, it's not even very you know, well designed, but you know, 70 lines of Python and 15 minutes later I could view the topology graphically. And, and um, the, the way I can do this is so if you look at the command that I have at the bottom of the screen, we can actually just pull directly from the REST API using JSON or, or any sort of other uh, REST-like mechanism. And the information that we get back is you know, a JSON formatted list of you know, this switch off of this port is connected to this switch off of this port. And we get a list of these, this information. This, so this is a link. Uh, this is the, the, the most basic low-level representation of a link. Uh, but it's just really easy to get. And so given that, you can run this script. Uh, so this is actually all the commands that I needed in one line. And apologizes for the, the demo. But you know, it's, a, it's a one line script. And I pipe it to dot. And I then get a live topology out of it. And so, you know, th this is the topology of the, of the demo network that I was showing you. And like I said, you know, this isn't necessarily pretty. It, it, it's not a partial finished product. At the same time, I threw it together in 15 minutes. And so, uh, there's a lot of things that come out of SDN much like this, where you, know, you can imagine the commercial products are coming. You know, I could show you very easily uh, you know, graphical versions of these things. And actually, I, I was just sort of being able to have one to, to show you. I wasn't able to get it working. But I, what's, I think, more important is not the individual instances, but the, the overall, this is easy to do. And, and so that's really kind of what I wanna, where I want to leave things, is that uh, you know, the, the idea that you have to do in the network, it's not you know, how well did I implement it, it's how easy it for you to implement it. And so I, I guess with that, uh, I'll take questions. So, so you're kind of dodging what I think is the most important question. Is what should you as a application writer be optimizing on, right? And so uh, an easy answer is performance. But you know, from the numbers I can show you, uh, performance is not really the bottleneck. Really the, the bottleneck is uh, ease, of, ease of writing, feature, uh, feature mobility, feature velocity, those types of things. And a lot of that comes down to the language you like to work in. A lot of it comes down to the quality of the additional tools. So that's why a, a, a lot of what the, the focus of this has been is on the debugging tools, on what, is the APIs look, what do the APIs look like. And some of these things are very personal. Some of these things are actually very much in flux. I mean, uh, I, I, I wrote this uh, benchmarking tool that will give you a number, and you, know, you can put to that control, and this one has a higher number, but it's not really clear how useful that number is. Uh, and a lot of this comes down to your personal belief in you know, the productivity that you can have with a specific set of software. And, and that's unfortunately, I mean, it's the true answer, it's a much less black and white answer. Great, thank you, Rob.